I'm Jane Craigie and I'm going to chair today and I've got a fantastic panel with me on screen that you'll see. If you've got any questions, please put them into the chat and I'll try and keep an eye on it. Um, and what we're talking about today is the reimagining of rural communities through the lens of young people or those that work with young people. Um, the reason that I'm so passionate about this is that myself and my colleague Rebecca Dawes wanted about, about four years ago wanted to understand why young people leave rural areas and what we need to do to build their confidence and also communities welcoming um, behaviors towards young people and also what the challenges are and today we're going to with this beautiful panel in front of us we're going to be discussing that um, to get their views and, and their diversity uh, in where they live and their backgrounds will really add a, a, a massive dimension to this which you'll you'll hear as we go through today what we found from our work is that diverse youth aware communities with strong intergenerate intergenerational links and relationships are the most resilient and the most attractive to young people which isn't any surprise but there are some dogged challenges that never go away and in all of our research we repeatedly find these challenges so depopulation particularly of young people an aging demographic in rural areas housing and land access is a problem transport and connectivity the lack of diversity and inclusion and careers are difficult to build and it's hard to get a consistent living from our research we found that rural people, rural young people, earn between 20 and 25% less than their urban peers. So there are a lot of challenges, but we also know that there are a lot of opportunities. And I think the pandemic for all of us has, has shone a light on, on the value and the power of green spaces. Um, and within our panel, we've got people that come from or have a, a history in rural places and you'll hear from all of them about their love of these places and, and the importance of place local food local people and local communities to their lives so i'm going to start by asking them all to introduce themselves and and really why they're interested in the discussion we're having today which is reimagining rural communities through the lens of young people and i'm going to start with anya Hi, um, I'm Anya. Uh, yeah, um, I'm 18 and I just um, this last year moved out of um, Dorset in the rural community um, into Manchester uh, to go to university, um, which was a really big change for me. Um, I'd lived um, in Dorset my entire life. I was raised in a small holding um, and I had a pet cow and I kind of ran a micro dairy and um, made cheese and everything uh, alongside like a traditional education in school and everything. Um, but yeah, uh, in uh, October 2020, um, I helped found um, the youth group Flame, which is um, the uh, youth part of uh, the Landmarkers Alliance. And we kind of did that because it was it was 2020. It was the pandemic. Everything was really remote any, anyway, um, which was all on top of the fact that in rural communities, you are quite remote all the time, especially if you're from an alternative background uh, which our farm kind of was um, and I thought we needed to promote the kind of different um, farming systems to what um, everyone around us was doing uh, which was a lot more big uh, large scale um, so I thought it was kind of that after that summer it was the summer where there were a lot of people were talking about climate um, those were the Black Lives Matter protests etc um, and young people really really cared um, so I just thought um, people would care about food and farming if we told them about it. It's just a lot of people didn't really have access to uh, stuff about it, especially kind of when you didn't know, like you didn't live in an urban community where that was all being talked about. Um, so I, we use a lot of social media and uh, stuff to kind of spread the message. We did a lot of remote work in the first few months of um, existing. We still do. <laughs> Pandemic is still going. Um, so yeah, that's what we do. We, we're promoting agroecology. Um, people who are interested in farming as a career we're showing we're trying to show them it's a viable career um we're trying to educate other people and make it an accessible field for people to learn about and um we just want to create a community in rural areas for young people who find it quite isolating a lot of the time thank you anya and tressa hi so i'm my name is tressa i'm from cape clear island um, in Ireland, it's right down by the Fastnet Rock. It's an offshore island with um, about 130 people. 
um, so it's considered uh, quite rural. <laughs> Um, and I grew up on a dry stock farm and I suppose between the farming and living by the sea, I suppose that's where my passion for sustainable food systems and sustainable farming stemmed from. And in the last probably year and a half, I've been really involved in the Food Systems Summit, um, which the UN ran. It was the first time they ever ran a summit dedicated to food systems and food. And I was involved in a working group with that. And then also I am one of the founders of the Cape Clear Farmers Market. So it's the first farmers market, a local farmers market in our area. And I think my biggest takeaway from creating the farmers market was how one small change can have huge impact on a rural area. And that I suppose is why I want, why I'm so invested in this kind of discussion and what rural youth do, or the Rural Youth Project because I do want to eventually return and um, yeah. Trust, so we'll we'll touch more on that on on the one small change and I know Anya will be able to add to that as well but it's such an important point is what are the triggers to and what are the small changes that we can all make and have a you know have an ability to make these changes um, what impact will they have on other people and community. Um, Kieran to you next. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Kieran. I live on the Orkney Islands. Um, I am a playwright, sorts by trade, um, and I was taken back um, to the island of Hoi just before the pandemic. Um, and then I've been here for two years and sort of rediscovered the love for my home, the issues that it does have. Um, but I've become really passionate about the community um, and I want to use storytelling uh, through playwriting as a way to bring people together and to start reclaiming our own narrative as remote, rural, small communities. Particularly, I'm interested in equality and diversity, which we don't have an awful lot of. Um, but from my own experience as a gay chap, um, I find it incredibly inclusive and kind and welcoming. Um, but as national papers or statistics will tell you, we would probably be deemed homophobic. So, um, <laughs> or the other side of it, the happiest place to live in the world. So I'm slightly irritated by the one dimensional depictions of small rural places. So I'm really intrigued in how we can use storytelling to bring people together um, and break stereotype to some extent um, and really build our own image of what we are, who we are and what we want our future to be. Um, so that's that's about uh, that's about it so far. Thank you, Kieran, and we're, we're absolutely thrilled. Um, Kieran's going to be working with us for the next three or four months, um, putting those storytelling skills to to um, good use for us. One of the things that we like to do is capture case studies of young people living rurally to to represent that diversity and and the good stories and and also the the more challenging stories. So we're really looking forward to having you, Kieran. And finally, Hannah. I knew I'd have a problem with the mute button. Um, hi, my name is Hannah Jordan. I am, um, I actually am completely, I was born in Surrey near, near London, but at age, from age three, I, I grew up in the middle of nowhere in a little place in Chumley called North Devon and a small holding where we had, um, you know, we grew our own veg and we had uh, little goats and sheep and we also had a cow, Anya. Um, so uh, it was a, it was a, a, a wonderful sort of growing up really, but that also did come with with lots of different um, kind of challenges around identity and belonging and opportunities um, and, uh, and and kind of communicating really. Um, so I currently work for I do some training and assessing, um, and I work for the Racial Equality um, Council in Plymouth as well as a company called Youth Focus Southwest which hopes to kind of really raise the issues for, for young people in the Southwest and youth work. But for 25 years, I've been a youth worker um, in Plymouth and um, I've worked in kind of participation training, involving young people um, in decision-making to uh, working with young people that go missing, um, as well as kind of school-based and locality-based, community-based kind of youth work. So a whole 25 years of, of, of that. Um, I've also, uh, um, for, since a long time, uh, been involved in a, um, a junk percussion group called Weapons of Sound, 
um, and you'll be able to see the, the link for Weapons of Sound in my uh, speaker notes. But um, we are a junk percussion band that go and we um, perform and we do workshops um, in kind of primary schools and, and uh, team building and we play at festivals and um, and abroad as well, sometimes not after the pandemic, but um, but um, but the main thing is it's bringing a green message to to children, young people and, and, and people of all ages and all abilities, really. Um, and we're playing plastic barrels and kitchen sinks and gas pipes and things like that. Um, and I think uh, people's access to, to kind of the, the green message through doing it differently in music is, is really powerful. Um, and I think the final thing that I would uh, say is that the thing about Weapons of Sound is it started as part of a youth group. Um, so it's, it partly, you know, it started as a youth group, it was an opportunity and it sort of grew from there really. Um, but again, I'm really interested in, in this discussion because I think um, I had to move away from the rural, uh, living rurally to, um, to be able to, to, to do youth work, to be able to, um, to link, to be able to be in a band um and and to have, have lots, lots of those opportunities so um that's transition and, and i do you know still go back to um to where my parents live and where i grew up and um i'm sure i will return there one day because it's um because it's really idyllic i think that's something that we'll all we all share hannah and i know everybody on on this call um has either or is living a dual life between the rural that they love and want and the city which is the reality of of living working studying um and i, I was going to ask you all to tell us a little bit about what are the push and pull factors and i'm sure we'll touch on some of the challenges but also some of the loves that you have and uh, Kieran, I'm going to start with you, having studied in in Glasgow and living on Hoy. I think that, and probably you and Tressa, uh, you know, you you have the extremes of coming from a small island, uh, going to big cities. Um, just tell me what what were the push and pull? What are the push and pull factors for you, but also your friends? Was I to go first? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, Kieran. <laughs> um, I guess. I think actually from quite a young age, I think at school, um, I think there's almost this kind of expectation that you should be going. So I think um, there's a systemic problem where I think you're sort of, the guidance you're given is that if you want to progress, you have to leave. And if you stay, there's almost something wrong with that. And it's taken me a long time to see, well, that's kind of the wrong way around. Um, but, you know, some things you do have to go. So I did want to go to uni um, and I had, there's lots of fun things that you can do in Glasgow. And there are some opportunities um, professionally and personally that just aren't always available in very rural places. Um, I think we see younger people leaving rural communities for the city for work, uh, different opportunities. And I think for an LGBTQ community, I think that's um, exacerbated even further. There's less of you. Um, so it's much harder to make those connections. So I think isolation does become a real problem, uh, especially if you're a minority, as welcoming as a, as a community can be. Um, so I think almost for personal development, as much as you do want to stay, there are some things that you just have to leave, um, which I think is, is quite a shame. It's hard to start a family or, or anything like that um, without having to go away. Um, so there's there's quite a lot uh, that kind of pushes you out, I think, uh, that's, that's not really good enough. Um, but funnily enough, when I'm in the city, uh, I find also uh, there's a kind of a push and a pull, but I find myself getting more and more sick of the city a lot faster than I do in the countryside. And a lot of friends um, would love to come here, but it's very expensive. Um, there's not a lot of housing opportunities. There's not a lot of work opportunities. Even now that we're in a virtual age, people can work online. Um, a lot of friends would want to come up, but you know the, the housing market, if there's anything at all, it's possibly a ruin that's gonna cost 200,000 pounds and 300,000 pounds to renovate. And there's all these things that make it really challenging. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of infrastructural issues in places like the islands and highlands and rural UK that make it pretty hard. 
uh, to relocate here. Um, so yeah, maybe that that's a bit of a rundown. Thank you, Kieran and Tressa. I saw you nodding your head through that. Um, but you've you've studied in Dublin. You're working in London, and you come from a, a an island off the south, south coast of Ireland with 130 people. What are the push and pull factors for you, and why do you want to go back? Yeah, very similar to Kieran. There's so many that overlap. I think for us, what's I don't know if you have a Kieran, but we have to leave um, at the age of like 11 or 12 to go to secondary school. So there's no secondary school. So before you can even think about it, you're gone Monday to Friday. Um, and then I suppose that like transient lifestyle becomes such a norm. Like I'm so used to just going in and out places, that adaptability. Um, so I don't know if that's a push or a pull, but before we can even think about it, we're out. Um, and I suppose also in my community, it's really encouraged to go abroad. It's really encouraged to leave, go to cities, go to university, which is good, I think you should go and experience it because then you know you really either do or don't want to go back to the rural area you'll never have that regret so yeah I left when I was to go when I left for secondary school and then I left again to go to university in Cork and I think also similar things like the transport is very difficult because like you can't get home all the time it's not easy and it's not cheap to get home that's probably a push factor um but and housing I suppose like if new people want to come that is an issue um but definitely i think education and the experience opportunity are push and pull factors because you do i did i left because and i moved to london a couple of months ago because i wanted the experience i know i will eventually return but for the fun of it socializing you can't really socialize there's not many people and you know everyone so it's nice to like have that experience and have the fun of it and then return and hopefully bring some ideas back um, and like learn from the city experience and try and replicate it potentially in a different form, but somehow bring it back. Yeah, that's that's something that we see repeatedly, particularly with the, the sort of next generation on for you from you with people that are thinking of, of having a family and, and wanting to settle. And they find that those skills that they're bringing back are super important for developing the community and the lifestyle that they want. Um, Anya, you're in your first year at Manchester studying politics and uh, I can't remember what else, um, but yeah, I'm sure you'll fill us in. What does it feel like for you? You've just been home for Christmas. What are the push and pull factors for you? Um, well, one of the I, I always knew I was going to leave uh, for a bit. Um, obviously, everyone says about socialising, education, etc. But it was for me the time I realized just how much I loved rurality was um was in lockdown um in the start of the pandemic uh when I realized kind of that I love being on the farm I got a lot of time <laughs> to spend with my cow and it was like when I got outside off the laptop and got to like experience it really um but yeah as soon as kind of I was allowed to leave it was like I I did feel this kind of feeling like if I just going out here isn't gonna cut it anymore like I need to get somewhere that's bigger I need to be able to meet more people um and do more and just the idea that I'd been sat in front of a laptop for so long it was it was like I really need to socialize and you can't really do that in where I live there was barely any transport was my biggest thing it was you can't really see your friends impromptu you can't really um even like working you can't go to a job um without your parents giving you a lift or learning to drive, which is a really big factor. Um, it's just really hard to, it was really hard to make links, I think, you, to connect with people um, in, when it isn't in front of a screen. Uh, and that's mostly what the push was for me, was just that I wanted to talk to people in person again. <laughs> um, obviously, obviously um, when I'm at university, I do, really miss just the being able to step outside and see nature stroke a cow it sounds really it sounds really basic but it's it's really fulfilling <laughs> it's something that I really miss yeah yeah you've touched on a lot of important things there we 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 call it the tyranny of distance you know when you're when you're not earning enough to be able to afford a car to be able to go and see your friends or make new friends or find you know find people that are like you then it just makes it so difficult doesn't it 
And Hannah, you've um, you've you beautifully. Sorry, I've got a Labrador in the background. Um, you beautifully described your your childhood, um, and you're now living in Plymouth. Um, what are the push and pull factors for you, and 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 what would make you return or help you return to the kind of lifestyle that you'd like? I think the um what what kind of pushed me out of um living so rurally was was about that isolation and I think it was about sort of things like employment and and um and uh you know opportunities and, and to you know develop a career um but again it was it was racism as well um so racism and kind of linked to kind of cultural identity and I think that I couldn't have made the steps and the journey and the development where I was so again that was a bit of a, of a push factor and it was an opportunity to come and live in Plymouth with my sister um, <laughs> over the summer which really just that was my and I suddenly had moved which is which is great um, but I think the, what would kind of pull me back um, I think um, definitely I, I think I've been able to maintain you know the kind of going out foraging and um and that kind of making jams and gin and, and lots of things um and uh i've been able to kind of you know keep keep that going in a way and also to know that you know when i've got quite a lot going on i'm thinking quite a lot then it's you know to walk to the beach or to walk on a country roads in a field um does me a huge amount of good so um so it's almost like i i, you know, I think the growing up in in the in the country taught me some really resilient kind of tools which I, I've been able to kind of um, you know um, transpire really to to, to, uh, to to my life in the city but um, but yeah I think I think those would be the the um, push and pull factors and I'm, I'd be you know when I think about what I'd love to happen I think it would be a cottage with a garden that I could grow veg and again have the, the kind of the, the the animals that I had when I was growing up so um but it, you know it's not it's not too much of a dream away really that that's so interesting hearing that and it touches on a, another we've got a compounded issue haven't we now with the pandemic you know Anya mentioned how 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 much you know that reconnection with her place and valuing her place um was so powerful during the pandemic a lot of people that don't know what rural living is like have have decided they want some of it and that's um that kind of makes the challenges even more challenging um and and it brings me on to there's been a couple of um questions and comments in the chat about some of the you know some of the challenges major challenges which we have started touching on housing um and transport um and i was going to ask um i'm going to touch on on housing first because if you haven't got somewhere to live if you can't afford somewhere to live or if it's inappropriate housing it can be a massive barrier to um going back to returning um, Kieran, you you live in an expensive part of Scotland. Um, a lot of the islands are expensive, and and they are um, very attractive to to people who have money to buy up. What's going on in Scotland with housing, and and do you see any signs of uh, you know Have you got any optimistic outlook as far as housing is concerned? Yes, there's lots of uh, there's always optimism, um, but there's lots of problems. There's so many problems with housing. Um, there's a sort of a, a very, very positive and negative thing in the pandemic and that people have really seen, like we've been saying, how brilliant um, the rural parts of the country are. Um, and Orkney, especially like people have, have seen all the good things about why it is to live there, the peace, the tranquility. Um, but what it has done is there's been a sort of ill-informed methodology of buying property without people are buying things without seeing them and they're realizing then that they've actually bought a ruin um, and it's going to cost so much more money and what's happening in, in a lot of the outer islands is that we're having this sort of financial dominance that's outpowering local communities um, and it really is starting to harm um, smaller places younger people particularly uh, don't can't compete with that financial clout so can't really buy a property on their in their home community so that's one of the other reasons why they will then be leaving 
Um, and then often if people have bought a property without viewing it or knowing an awful lot about that particular place, um, they might then realize it's not for them and leave. And we've had instances where people still maintain the ownership of the property and don't do anything with it. So there's fewer and fewer um, avail things available for people, younger people, uh, working people, which is quite unfortunate. And we also are starting to experience uh, second home ownership. So sort of even here, one of one end of the island um, is owned, it's holiday lets. Um, and that's another thing that kind of drives up the price within the postcode. Um, so there are a lot of problems at the, the moment, um, but there are some places taking on doing really good stuff. Like there's um, development trusts across islands who are taking matters into their own hands, who are getting fed up of waiting for government intervention, council intervention, and are just buying up old churches and renovating them and putting um, criteria like you have to be in your 20s, 30s, you have to come in here and have a family because we need to regenerate the community. And they're really working so hard to try and regenerate. But what that does then do is burden volunteers. These committees, these development trusts are made up of volunteer people who are trying their best. So what we then have is a, a burden on free labor as well. So. I think at some point we are going to need uh, governments at local and national level to intervene and put funding into these projects. Um, so, yes, I am hopeful. I'm fascinated by um, housing co-ops and different projects that make these that's you could buy like a big complex ruin that way and create like five flats from it. That would, things like that are really interesting. But at the minute, funding isn't quite there. Um, I don't think it's quite limiting um, and again relies on volunteers to uh, take on an awful lot of uh, the burden. There's some there's so many good points in that, but devolving um, the responsibility and the budget locally has got to be absolutely at the heart, hasn't it? And, and giving communities responsibility, forming co-ops. Um, but that means people have got to work together, doesn't it? Which which I suppose is something that we will touch on. Yes, I would just jump in there. As well. I know, <laughs> even in a, in a count, you're so right. The devolution of power is so important and that um, even within a county, some areas are just vastly different. In Orkney and Shetland, you've kind of got like a main town and then loads of little communities scattered around the edges. Um, so empowering people to the really local level to make decisions and that collaboration is so vital. Yeah, I completely agree. And um, Noah, I know you've put some really good stuff in, in the chat and Alana as well. Um, if you want to have a look a bit more at, at cooperation, housing cooperation, have a look at the Finnish village mu movement. Um, and in our latest episode, I think, of our Rural Youth Project magazine, Tread, there's, a re there's an article within that about the Finnish village movement and, and how they're working to provide um, eco, small, minimalistic housing with big gardens. Um, and, and it's just a great example of how co-ops can work. Um, and, uh, you know, linked to housing is also land so every single one of you have mentioned something about land and about doing things um, and and Anya and Hannah in particular growing um, Anya I'm going to ask you a question which touches on your work with flame as well um, how much of a role does land access for young people play in our broken food system and how are land justice and food justice as well as social justice entwined Well, I think um, it's quite obvious that they're massively aligned for me. Um, so something we've seen a lot is that um, new entrants have a really hard time uh, having access to finding access to land, um, which means um, there's very little diversification in rural areas um, of new people moving there um, that aren't from from a traditional farming background. So that's because, um, well, first of all, uh, land ownership is kind of quite dominated by um, historical monopolies, um, people who, who uh, bought it hundreds of years ago and it stayed in the family. Um, it's really it's really expensive because um, 
people, big farms own it and just rent it out. Um, and there's a massive racial disparity in land ownership as well. Um, so new entrants trying to come into that, um, they have very little capital to buy um, uh, land. Um, there's not high paying jobs in the farming sector really for new entrants. So um, anyone who wants to start their own project, there isn't really that kind of support uh, in um, financially. And there's also not very much training for people who haven't grown up in that area. They don't know much about farming, so they won't really be able to start up something new by themselves. Um, and yeah, so even even if they manage to find the capital, they're willing to um, kind of start that job. There's there's not much there's no community for new people coming into the area, and that's especially um, in minoritized communities. So uh, minority ethnic backgrounds and um, LGBT people. Um, it's just it's really isolating. There isn't much support systems. Um, for that because it's so monopolized by the traditional kind of farming systems that own a lot of the land um so yeah i think that land reform is just absolutely essential to the equality that could arise in rural areas um just by redistributing and and that everything that you've said there touches on on something that we're really passionate about at the rural youth project which is um, how do young people um, or people that want to access land, you know, how do they um, raise their voice? How do they get involved? How, do, in particular in patriarchal societies, communities, where it's very difficult. And you're you're right, land ownership in small in a small number of hands is never going to help that. Um, there are some really good examples of of changes in in that. Um, but I think most of what we see where young people are feeling more empowered and more involved is, is in urban settings. And it's probably a good opportunity to bring Hannah in here about um, you know, access to land on micro or macro scale. And this important point about people having the confidence to raise their voice and to ask for help and to learn the skills that Anya just touched on. Could you give us a little bit of insight with your work on, on how, and also your, your recommendations on how people could access land and, and, and get active in this way? Yeah, sure, I think it kind of goes back to a, um, a, a, a bigger picture really of, um, of, of government funding. Um, huge, huge amount of um, impact is, is felt, whether you're urban or rural, I think by government fund, funding. And you know, I think the fact that you know you've got um, you know you've got seventy percent of, of funding for youth services has been cut in the last ten years. Um, and again, whether you're urban or rural, you will feel the impact of that. Um, I think also you know the things like poverty. Um, you know, four point three million people are, are now kind of experiencing poverty um uh, in this country uh, and that's kind of for children that's about in a class of 30 that's about nine out of a class of 30 that are experiencing poverty and again more people using food banks so i think that this kind of brings up massive um kind of uh, issues around um you know mental health and services and, and access to to uh, opportunities and employment and and i think that there it kind of then it kind of emulates into into bigger bigger kind of issues where, where people kind of do want to own their own house or own their own land but it's it's so much more difficult I think for people and particularly people rurally as well um, to be able to have what maybe generations ago had that that kind of opportunity um, so yeah I, I think things are you know very very difficult and I think that even come kind of public transport is you know even even you know 10 miles 15 miles away from Plymouth you know you have you know have really poor kind of transport um, systems where you know you get a bus on a Thursday and then if you miss the last bus then you know you're waiting you wait until Friday or, or next week so again I, I think raising young people's voice um, is really really important um, but I think it's really difficult when you've perhaps also not got the the funding the you know the youth activities that kind of adds to young people's you know self-esteem and confidence 
and them to kind of to have a voice and also to take part in, in democracy as well. Things like UK Youth Parliament is a good opportunity to have about how young people can get involved um, at the earlier voting age of, of 18. But but still, I think being being a part of, of that and, and being a part of being able to influence decision makers for, with, for funding um, for those, uh, you know, for the government is just really important, but it's, but it's difficult, but it's difficult. There's some really important points there, you know, unless you get the fundamentals right, you know, people aren't going to be confident enough to be able to see a future for themselves. Um, it does bring me on to, um, to, to so made, made me think about, you know, some of the big challenges we've got ahead, you know, and if young people don't feel confident enough to have their say and to be present in conversations that makes life incredibly difficult because you know how how can you if you can't see any way for you to influence change uh, and i think cop 26 was was highly criticized by some young people because um they they didn't feel they had a voice there um whether that's true or not um you know i i can't say i'm not a young person um so i don't know but somebody who will give us a little bit of light on that is tressa you know with with what you've been doing tressa you were involved with um the, with cop 26 um, and you are very active in, in, as a young person in raising your voice, but also helping others. How do you think young people can be more involved with the conversation? What are some of the tools that communities and society need to, need to use? Yes, COP was a very interesting one. There was a lot of criticism. Um, tokenism was 100% there. Everyone saw it. Um, young people were in but weren't allowed to speak. Um, I, even myself, I couldn't actually get into the blue zone, which is where all the decision making was. Um, so I was doing the best I could, but on the outside. But I suppose one point from, yes, it was criticized, but also they have to start somewhere. Uh, it was the COP this year, the COP26 was the conference that had the most young people at, out of all of them, um, out of all the cops over the years um so i suppose you have to start somewhere so hopefully at the next one there'll be more pe young people in the decision making room and not just sitting there and told they actually aren't allowed to participate <laughs> which they kind of i don't know how but look they have to start somewhere um but yes i've been quite involved at raising um or trying to get the youth voice out there and i suppose listening to all of you from scotland and england and just from what i know i know ireland i'm quite proud of how ireland involves young people in decision making and in um, different aspects of policy. So I'm the UN Youth Delegate for Ireland this year or until September, so that's my year. And I have had the privilege of speaking. So I spoke at the third committee um, about two months ago, I think it was just before COP and there was 50 countries involved. It was for the right to food and I gave um, Ireland's declaration um, and I, they let me, um, along with others in the Department of Foreign Affairs, we wrote it together. I definitely had my voice in there. And I was the only person, young person out of 50 countries that spoke at it. And two other countries did acknowledge it. So I suppose I'm quite proud in that sense. And also at a local level, I think getting involved is just joining things. I'm on the board of my co-op. And that's the best way to get my voice heard in my local area. And they do like local areas or co-ops and, you know, again, rural areas would be criticized for not involving young people or, oh, they can't speak, they don't. But I actually think rural areas are nearly better at involving young people because they want us. So they're like, okay, do you want to join? Great, because we need you. So we're going to listen to you. So from my experience, I've been very much listened to, but I know that's not the same for everyone. I suppose I've just hit the jackpot with my co-op because uh, we're, um, I think I'm the youngest by a good 10 or 15 years and it ranges up to 60. So um, I'm lucky in that sense. But yes, it is um, a complex world involving youth. But maybe just listening to you, maybe a lot of the power and having seen all of the young people that were demonstrating in Glasgow, maybe the power is outside the blue room. You know, the social power is very strong. Um, and I think, I think also the disruption that young people cause is uh, cause and create is really powerful. Anya, I know you were involved with COP as well. Um, what were your reflections on it and, and how do you think, what can we learn from it about young people having their say and being involved in, in these crucial conversations? 
Yeah, I was in the um, I was in the blue zone, um, but I do agree with a lot of what um, the criticism was saying um, about how little of what young people were saying in there was actually listened to. Um, and a lot of what Flame does is we want to work on building social movements and building support for our causes outside of like government because government it it does it does some stuff but I think it's more about creating social change um it's more important for us um so when I was at COP26 I was in the conference most of the week but I did also join in on the Fridays for Future march and in on the um COP26 coalition march through the city and I just felt a lot more inspired by the by the people moving along the streets than I did when I was in the rooms listening to all the politicians talk. Um, I don't think I saw any young people speak uh, in the official um, conference meetings. There was a lot, there were panels on young people, but there were no young people actually speaking at them. So I think that says a lot about it. Um, so yeah, it, this was the first year I think there was a youth day at uh, COP26 in the last 27 years it's been running so I think there's a lot of work they need to do on involving youth voices and actually considering what we actually have to say rather than just doing it mostly for show. Yeah I think that's right I think there's also real value in in creating your tribe you know we my colleague Rebecca and I had no authority to set up the Rural Youth Project we just did it because we felt it was important um, and, and I think there's a lot to be said, and that's what I love about young people around the climate issues and changing our food systems is that you're active, you're out there, you're talking about it, and social media is your friend to do that. Um, I'm going to bring Kieran in now about um, Scotland. So Ireland's really good. So we talk about influencing policymakers. Ireland is really good and really inclusive of young people. Kieran, what's been your experience of, of Scotland and what can others learn? From, from the activities that you've been involved in? Um, yeah, I mean, I, after listening to Tressa, I would just say we should copy Ireland. That sounds brilliant. Um, so <laughs> Scotland's not too bad, but I think Ireland's leading the way and we ought to just copy that. Um, um, Scotland overall, I suppose in a national picture, it's not too bad for inspiring people to get involved, young people. Um, I think we still have, there's still perception, I mean we have the uh, Scottish Youth Parliament, um, I think that, that's, I don't, I'm not sure how much that actually influences the policy, but it's very good at building confidence and getting people involved. Um, but broadly outside of Glasgow and Edinburgh, if we look to the Highlands and Islands, there was just recent things um, like the Western Isles Council only just um, elected a woman um, to the council chamber. So we're quite a long way off in a lot of areas from getting young people involved. Um, we've only just barely gotten gender representation. Um, but I think what it is is perception and that we need to change that. So why I quite like stories and storytelling is that we're sort of building a different narrative because when you actually get in the room with decision makers, I've been doing it more locally um, while I've been back on the Orkney Islands, but I think people struggle because they think they're not going to be heard, but often they are. Councils, development trust, all these different committees, community councils, um, even the MP and MSP, often they don't know is what I'm finding. Like no one actually knows what to, if I talk about LGBTQ and young people, um, they often just don't know. So they'll listen to you. So I would just say, be confident. And a bit like Jane said, just stamp your foot and say, I'm gonna try this. I mean, and I, in our own island community, um, there's just been nothing for such a long time. And I think there's a confidence issue of people not getting involved, but I just sort of stormed into the local development trust where it has the authority to apply for funding. And I said, I want to apply for all of this and get this going. And we got the funding and they all just said yes. And I thought, oh, I thought everyone was going to say no, but I think there's absolutely a perception issue um, that we need to get better at telling a different story. So in Scotland, it's not too bad. Our leadership, I think, um, isn't isn't too bad. We've got good gender in the Scottish Parliament. Representation's not that bad. Nicola Sturgeon's really good, I think. I don't want to get too political, but it empowering young people 
she certainly does me, um, and lots of others. But when it gets to more local areas, I think we need to get a lot better um, at changing that narrative. Because in reality, people actually want to step down from councils and development trusts and roles of decision making and pass it on to the younger generation but they don't know how to inspire young people to come into that platform so i think we're at two different ends and the challenge is a lot easier than we think it is so we just need to tell people to go and join the council go and stand for election and i think we need a lot more young people in parliament I think um, we need to find a way, a, a campaign, you know, in America, they would probably just have the bravery to come up with this and say, we want everyone, loads of people in their 20s to come and stand for the Democratic Party this election. We don't do that here. I think we should. We should say, if you're this age, we want you to stand. We just need lots more young voices just stamping and making a mark. I Maybe I'm too optimistic at this Friday afternoon, but I, I sort of think if we're loud enough, things will happen. I think we need to humanise policy because I think if you look at who's making the policy, they're, they're a bit desensitised. They've got PhDs, they've all, you know, <laughs> kind of stereotyping here. You need all of that, but you certainly need um, the humanity in there and the individual perspective is so important. So I think we need a national campaign, a bit like Ireland, to have youth assemblies, delegations, empower young people to have the bravery to stand up and speak for themselves, I think would be brilliant. And we're seeing that here. Yeah, we are. But that, that's just, you've said so much that in the chat has come alive with, with what you've just said as well, Kieran. Um, Tressa, I'm going to ask you, you, you come from an island of 130 people and, and Kieran did touch on this, which is how you so bring it back down to local level with community. How do you tackle those relationships at a local level where you have the same people that are perhaps in power in, in those communities? And you've done a lot on Clare Island. Tell us what sort of what sort of things you did to be disarming and to get involved. Yeah, so that's always criticized, or not criticized, but it'd be always a discussion point is that, you know, people will be on these committees, like Kieran was saying, they'll be on it for ages. And they're probably more than happy to stand down if someone just stood up for it. Um, which, um, and I think well, people were probably surprised and other people weren't surprised when I did go for the co-op role on the board. And yeah, so I've been quite involved. Um, one of the main things I've done in 2020, which was the first, yeah, the first summer of the pandemic, oh, there's so many of them, <laughs> um, was I, along with two others um, in the community, set up a local farmer's market. So um, this was kind of aside from, we did it as neutral as possible, again, trying to like get as many people in, because it's always that battle of he said, she said, or someone said something and people don't like each other, or whatever, you have it everywhere. And we got the most neutral three of us to get together and create this farmer's market. And it was on, um, the co-op provided like the space, but it was very much like a democracy. Everyone had their say, people could come, they could go. There was no rules. There wasn't really much of an authoritative like head on the whole farmer's market, which I think worked like that model of community spirit. Like we have this thing in the Irish language called mehel. So it's, there's no direct translation to it in English, but it's the idea of people coming together to do like something good. So the farmer's market was kind of like a mehel. So we all came together and there wasn't like, again, there wasn't much, to it but it's worked because it's going into its this is its second and a half year so next year will be its third summer and I suppose that worked in the sense of getting as many people involved from as many different sides of it because um, it is always a challenge in rural areas and having to deal with people and having to deal with different opinions is always a challenge and as a young person coming into it I did get quite a fright at one point from people having opinions and I was like I'm just young I'm trying to do something you can help yourself if you want to do it um, and I suppose that's when I had like my other two on, who were helping me like with mentor. Um, one of them I'd kind of consider a mentor. She's the local development officer, which is so important because she knows the background to it. She's not as naive as me. <laughs> um, and I think um, going back to what everyone's kind of been saying is just to do things, to get involved. And the, Kieran mentioned it. And the first thing that came into my head was when you're asking, when you're asking for someone to do something, the worst anyone can ever say is no. So if you ask for something, they can say no, you go, okay, fine, go off and find another route down. And I think that's so important for young people to realize 
that that is the worst that can happen if someone says no. Oh, such such good advice. There's lots of good advice in that. And somebody's typed the word into the chat. So if you want to look it up, uh, the the Gallic word for um, for the collective, I suppose, is the best way of describing it, isn't it? Um, we've only got we've been told that we have to finish by five o'clock and I can't believe it's 10 to five already. But I want to ask you a really all a really important question at the Rural Youth Project, we're a huge fan of Rob Hopkins and the transition movement and, and his, his whole concept of reimagining rural place or reimagining anything. It's such a good tool. Um, but so what I want to ask you, and I'm going to read it out. I want you all to imagine you're waking up in 2032 and great things have happened everywhere. Positive changes are in motion and the world looks like a far more positive place. For one minute, could each of you paint a really visceral picture of what it looks like for the place and community you are most passionate about? So I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. And I'm going to start because I think he'll be best on his feet with Kieran. One minute. Um, I'm sort of like dumbfounded by all the good ideas of everyone else. I'm a thief. I'm an ideas thief. Um, I would have a ministry of um, islands and rural development and social justice and diversity, and it would have to be devolved, as would every other form of uh, government and parliament, possibly in the Shetland or Hebridean islands, and it would employ local people so they would actually know what they were talking about. And suddenly the infrastructure everywhere would improve, I think, if ministers and parliamentarians had to endure um, <laughs> as, as we would. Um, I would have lots more youth citizens assemblies. I would, what did I say there? Um, yes, and actually what I forgot to say, I think what we do need is that Rural Housing Scotland, there's so many good ideas already there, um, have the Smart Clack and Housing Project. So it's community led, um, it's eco builds, it's got limited funding, but it's brilliant. It's in Uist and they build houses and they have like communal workspaces and good Wi-Fi and access to the outdoors to attract young people in. Um, it's brilliant, it, it tackles isolation and all these things. So yes. I'll stop. Love that. Love the idea of ideas thievery. We we have built the Rural Youth Project on that. <laughs> I'm going to go to Anya next. So your 2032 bucolic vision. Uh, yes to everything um, Kieran said with the government change um, and putting more funding into rural areas. Um, but also on a smaller scale, I just think um, there would be... Um, local transport connections. Um, I think an ability to work, have a two um, a multiple aspects to a job in the countryside. So, so being able to work online, have a um, career that's um, in that aspect, but at the same time being able to, for me, just on a, personally, it would be the thought of being able to go outside and, and connect with a rural area, as well as having um, a job um in a different different way would be beautiful and i think that's quite uh, difficult to access at the moment to have both of those kind of jobs in the countryside um what else? so much so much that i want um i think young people in government is really really important i think young people just knowing about the the job of farming and the kind of beauty it can have that isn't just uh, low paid um, and unappreciated the fact that it's so fulfilling and that people want to come back to the countryside I think it'd be absolutely beautiful I love that um, I'm going to ask everybody in the chat as well could you put your one minute vision of 2032 in the places you love Hannah I'm going to ask you next for your 2032 in a nutshell, absolutely right. Okay, so um, I think it would be the more eco-friendly and eco-builds, um, exactly like Kieran said. There would be more government funding um, that, co that covers wherever you live. Um, there would be kind of less of a barrier for, for people, you know, people have to move out of rural to, to the urban to be able to get a career and stuff like that. I think, you know, we need to cut down that, that barrier really. Um, so people also have the choice about where they live as well. Um, sometimes the choice about where you live is about 
economic stuff or it's about where you work, um, I think it'd be amazing just to cut that down. That barrier uh, again technology it um and transport links uh, would mean kind of more you know uh, sort of less kind of loneliness and, and, and barriers there and economic kind of disparity um and then i think we could really kind of have more young people's voice because it is their tomorrow um it is you know this generation is their tomorrow um and young people are, are amazing just to be around and to listen to and to listen to their ideas they've got the ideas people should people should listen to them and then finally you know for obviously for poverty and, and mental health to be tackled um uh, properly properly um and i think you've got to ask the people that that affects for that to be um to get the proper solutions and then finally for the countryside to be to not to be seen as a place for second homes only um or the fact that you can kind of um go out earn your money and then kind of buy a house in the country if you want to you know i think just to just to be able to kind of break that message really that everyone has the choice about where they live and to break down those barriers would be amazing i think that was a minute probably over there you go. well it was lovely and trasa you're making your cup of coffee sunday morning 2032 what does it look like and my first one would be population. I'd love to see a thriving population with loads of young people. Um, so then you can socialize. <laughs> um, and then you don't have to go to the city to socialize or into towns. Also, um, I want to see young people proud and happy to go back to rural areas, not because they have to, but because they want to, and that they will have housing um, and there won't be a huge um, barrier to housing and transport, 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 transport. Like every one of us have like reiterated it. It's so difficult if you don't have a car. And then that brings in the eco side of it, the sustainability. I would love um, to hopefully that we've magically met all the targets <laughs> and there is um, like less overfishing and then the farming that it's more sustainable and that um, they get properly paid and it's brought through like how getting young people's opinions out that farmers get their opinions and their experience brought into the new schemes which i think is still so important um, because that idea of having people's voices heard goes across every single area is you can't make it without you can't make a policy or make any rules up without speaking to the person who it direct who it directly affects um, i think that's how i'd love to see it and i hope rural youth project is still going and thriving and still inspiring more young people because it definitely did me <laughs> <laughs> it will be and you're one of our brilliant ambassadors so thank you for staying involved with us and seeing you go from strength to strength is what we want we want young people to feel they can make a difference um, there are some really lovely all of your your visions for the future are, are just wonderful and i hope that 2032 does bring that and before we um close today have a look at some of the suggestions in the chat as well um, they really are some lovely thoughts. So we've got two minutes left. I can't believe the hour has gone so quickly. Um, the things for me that really have, have stood out from today, and I can't thank you all enough for, for being so open, honest and vibrant. And um, we could have gone on talking for another couple of hours. For me, be an ideas thief, um, turn up, be naive and just do it even though you don't have an invitation. Um, push for devolved power and for devolved budget. Unless we push for it, we're not going to get it. And give the power to young people. The point that Hannah made, you know, I believe it 100%. You know, I'm now into my 50s, but I, I don't have the ideas like you have, have the ideas. I, I'm a good ideas person, but not like somebody who is young. Um, and, and you're brave and keep on being young and keep on being brave because it is really, really important and try not to let confidence get in your way. Um, you know, if I knew what I know now when I was your ages, um, you know, I would have, I probably would have done some very different things. So, so stand up, be counted and get out of there. And if anybody wants to be involved with anything so flame with what Tress is doing, with what Kieran's doing, with what Hannah's doing or with what we're doing at the Rural Youth Project, then um, please just get in touch via Wova. But thank you ever so much. And Tigger, I think we're on time.